That was good. I usually am all professional and have a clicker, but I left it in my talk like two hours ago, so I'll not be using a clicker. And uh, I apologize, I got sick uh, recently, so my throat, my voice is still gone, but we'll see how this goes. So I'm presenting on strengthening your psychops team by leveraging neurodiversity. I'm gonna start by talking about who I am. My name's Megan. I recently got my master's in digital forensics. I have a couple of security certifications that I worked on during my degree. Uh, a lot of the people here have decades of experience. I also have 21 years experience breathing. So, <coughs> yes, yeah, stay up there, that 20 year experience mark. Uh, right now I'm working as a senior security analyst for a small startup uh, MSSP in Austin called Recon InfoSec. My expertise related to the talk I'm giving today is I have Asperger's syndrome. A couple of quotes to start us off to get you in the mindset of the, my talk is first one is by Steve, Steve Silverman. He's a former writer, editor for Wired, and he's an uh, autism advocate. He says that one way to understand neurodiversity is to think of the human uh, think in terms of human operating systems. Just because a PC is not running Windows does not mean that it's broken. Furthermore, CIP, uh, CIPD Neurodiversity at Work Guide talks about neurodiversity in the style of sports. Teams are made up of players with a variety of skills. You don't just hire the fastest runner or the strongest person or the highest jumper, best kicker. You hire a diversity of skill sets and a diversity of different uh, mindsets in order to make the strength of the team as a whole uh, strong. So we're going to talk about individuals who have high productivity, extreme attention to detail, they're logical, calculated, passionate individuals, and can hyper-focus on the work they do. Specifically, I'm focusing on individuals with high-functioning autism. So the problem I'm approaching and the reason I wrote this talk is about a high unemployment rate among high-functioning autistics. For the defined autism spectrum, only about 8% of individuals on the autism spectrum are below average um, intelligence and are unable to hold a full-time job. 92% of individuals on the spectrum can hold a full-time job and many times are above average IQ, yet we see a low unemployment rate. The reason is most likely tied to social and behavioral disabilities more than anything. It's not about our capabilities to perform the work or to understand the te technical details of things or how things work. It's the social and behavioral interactions we have with our peers. Some examples for myself is um, I tend to speak very loud. Um, at, at an unnatural noise level, I'm unable to control the volume of my voice. You'll find this with a lot of autistic individuals. Some of them will talk too quietly. For me, I talk too loud. So uh, it's great when I can uh, use my voice loudly in a room presenting to a group, but it tends not to be taken well when I'm one-on-one -on -one in a conversation in a tiny office and I'm speaking at the top of my voice. I don't notice it. It annoys people. It makes them not uh, care to um, be around me for long periods of time. I'm also very blunt. I say what I think, and if I believe it's factual, I don't really care about the impact it says. That could get me in a lot of trouble because sometimes the thing I think sh things I think should not be said, uh, but I will be very blunt and direct, so that can get me in trouble. Again, social thing, I don't have the filter that most people would have so it can get me in trouble. I'm very particular when it comes to certain things, such as my clothing. I'm only comfortable in certain types of fabrics, very particular forms of fabrics. So I buy the same pair of pants, five of them, because when one gets holes in, I'm gonna take three years to find a new pair of pants that I'm comfortable in. So I just buy them up, put them in the closet, and every time one gets worn out, I have a new pair to replace them. So again, the, nothing that impedes my capability to be a uh, security analyst, but something weird that people just 
as humans subconsciously judge and it's that one of those strange things. Other examples of how you might see this in other individuals is sensitivity to lights or sounds or other feelings in the environment that could, could affect uh, their behavior but not impact their ability to perform a job. This is a slide I added recently. I didn't used to talk about this much, but I share everything else now, so I share this. Um, part of the autism I have is that I have to accept that no matter how old I age, my emotional maturity will never reach that of a full adult. Sometimes I do okay, but a lot of times the way I handle incident, uh, handle uh, situations that make me uncomfortable or stress me out or upset, I revert back to the maturity of a six to eight year old. And it sucks, it's something I have to do, but it, it makes it hard for work. One of the lessons I've added to this talk that I think not many people know is that when you get frustrated with your boss, you can't give them the silent treatment. It will not work out for you in the end. And if you forget that and you do, when they ask you if you're giving them the silent treatment, don't say yes. <laughs> I had, a, had some bad experiences there because mentally I thought I was mad and so I didn't want to get in trouble for saying the wrong thing, so my solution was to not say anything. Uh, also, this picture is an example of why somebody should have figured out something was wrong with me a lot sooner because eight-year-old me is thrilled to have 30 days to multiplication mastery. So there's something going on with that brain a long time ago that should have been found out sooner. <clears throat> so the next part I talk about is there's companies that are already implementing this idea of autism at work, uh, employing individuals with autism in security and IT fields. So the first example is tech companies in general typically build um, autism at work programs. My favorite is SAP because they looked in, at the statistics and it was shown that 1% of the world's population is diagnosed with autism. And so since 1% of the world's population is diagnosed with autism, they asked why shouldn't 1% of their workforce be diagnosed with autism? So they have an autism at work program that they're aiming to recruit one per, uh, recruit enough employees that 1% of their population reflects the 1% of the world's population by 2020. Microsoft, New Relic, HP, and many others have programs because they've realized the, individual, the skills that these individuals possess, but they've also recognized the adjustments that need to be made to help these individuals thrive. Unit 9900 is the Israeli Army's Visual t uh, Intelligence Division. When you turn 18 in Israel, you are obligated to perform military duty before going into whatever career path you choose. The thing was that high-functioning autistic individuals who, like I've said, have the, uh, the intelligence to perform tasks and jobs, they were growing up alongside their peers and then when they turned 18, all their peers were sent to the military as they received letters in the mail saying, sorry, we don't need you. But these individuals said, but we want to help, we can, let us prove it. So the Visual Intelligence Division was formed. They employed these individuals. They put them in a role that they found that these individuals succeeded at. It was sitting in front of two computer screens 24-7, looking at identical high-resolution images taken at different time periods and seeing if they could spot any differences that could indicate enemy movement or IEDs or anything, any other little objects that may be missed by someone who didn't have high attention to detail. So the, the great thing about this program is that after having it running for a while, they realized that the individuals in this unit performed very, very well, gave, gave a lot of, uh, had a huge contribution to the military, and yes, management, managing them was slightly different, but it wasn't unachievable, and that they were finally able to bring these individuals in. They taught the leaders how to manage these individuals and were able to integrate them into the units they wanted to be in, other units. Exhibit C is expertise. Um, 
they're a company, I, I got to talk to their founder, it's really cool. They say, uh, yeah, they say that their company, they're basically like a contracting MSP, MSSP. They contract out developers, quality assurance, uh, big data, security analysts. And the individuals they hire, almost their entire workforce is made up of individuals with high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome. And uh, I got to hear a bunch of cool stories about the culture of an organization that's basically flipped of what you usually see instead of a few neurodiverse individuals with a lot of neurotypical individuals. They have a high population of autistic individuals with a few neurotypicals. And one of the neurotypical women who works in their office said that her favorite part is that people with autism, they get to the point and they talk about what needs to be talked and they don't fill in the thing with any social intricacies. So those one hour meetings that would be booked on calendars like at other companies that would run for like an hour and a half, two hours because people are chatting and like saying things they don't need to say, would run for 30 minutes at Aspertise. She'd walk in because everyone would be like, here's what we need to say, now leave me alone and walk off. And so there's kind of that, that those fun little benefits that you find. And uh, the other list of companies there are other companies that either hire autistic individuals and contract them out and then manage them kind of themselves under the other, but let them out, go out to other companies or their programs that train and help employ autistic individuals and help the hiring company uh, learn how to manage them. So a study uh, in Australia actually showed that 59 employers who were asked about their autistic employees saw an increase in um, average, they saw an above average performance. They saw that attention to detail and passion that I was talking about. Um, they saw new skill sets brought into the workplace because it's people who think differently. So you're going to see different skill sets. They saw that these employees adapted quite well in the environment. And despite the stigma that if you hire an individual with disabilities, your cost to employ them is going to go up, they saw little additional cost to the employer. JP Morgan specifically said that it only took three to six months to train an autistic worker to do the work that employees who were there for three years, who took three years to train to do those same jobs and were able to do it with 50% more efficiency. So we say that the issue is social and behavioral deficiencies. The people have successfully done it. And I, I propose that the, the solution here is one awareness, under, and it's that change of mindset of saying that autism is not a disability. It, 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 ha it has associated difficulties with it, but you need to focus on the benefits that come with it when you're considering hiring an autistic employee. The, the things that I kind of have to deal with on my own, the, the social challenges, um, I'm in a role where I sit at a computer all day. I don't often interact with people, so I may have poor social skills at times, but like if my job requires, it doesn't require me to interact with people, like why, why are you judging my social skills? So focus less on the things that I have to deal with at home, my personal struggles, and focus more on the benefits that I'm bringing by coming and uh, applying to work with you. And then also, I say that it's not much, uh, it doesn't take much to hire these employees. It doesn't, you have, but you do have to adapt. I'm not saying to manage them just as you manage everyone else. There's things to do, but they're simple things and they're, it doesn't take much. So how do you do it? Do you adapt? So the most of what I'm gonna talk about is once you have an autistic employee you're working with, but I start off with just saying, before you can have those autistic employees in, we need to fix the way our industry hires individuals. Right now, we have very strict, and our job postings are written, one, unrealistically, telling you you need 10 years experience in a product that's existed for five years, um, requiring 10 years of education, PhDs for entry-level positions. When some of the smartest people I've met in the security industry are people who didn't go to college but sat in their bedroom and studied 
by themselves and got hands-on time with the computer and taught themselves everything they know. The other thing that's specifically, uh, that's specifically challenging with the way we'd write job posts in this industry, specific to autistic individuals, is we take things very literally. And so if you have these solid, straight requirements that, that say like X number of years, X number of degrees, X number of uh, times doing this, that's going to be something that I'm going to struggle with because like a lot of people think like, well, I don't have three years, but I've got two years and I studied a year in school, so I could apply and you know maybe they'll consider that I have enough experience overall. Like what's the worst you apply? You don't. But someone like me will look at it and be like, three years experience? Oh, I only have 364 days plus two years, so technically not three years, so I'm not going to apply. So like I, those stringent requirements, it's not as easy for me to go, well, I'll apply that they might turn me away, but I'm pretty close, so maybe they won't. So starting with a scenario before I dive into specific points is this comes from an actual challenge I faced at work was there's a limit of resources bandwidth available to work on projects. I had an idea for a project I wanted to work on and I was told, um, I was told what you would tell a neurotypical, like, hey, great idea, let's reapproach it when we have more resources available. Remind me about it when uh, we're less busy. So there's a part of that sentence that needed to change, and we, we worked on it, me and my manager, and we found that that change helped, is instead of saying remind me about it when we're less busy, we say remind me about it in a couple weeks. The reason for this is because I have trouble interpreting subjective statements because I don't think like you. So what you consider to be less busy is might not be what I consider to be less busy. You may one, I'm not in your role, so how am I supposed to know logically when we as a whole are less busy if I don't know how busy you are? Two, I typically take on a lot more and do a lot more faster than most people. So my less busy is you're really busy. So I need, I need a more of an objective approach to it. A couple weeks. A couple weeks is something I can put on my calendar. I'll come back to you. And if we still don't have the resources, fine. Just tell me another couple weeks. As long as I have that strict kind of like that, that objective guidance. Because the other thing that happens when you say less busy, I, so like I've learned like that I might not understand what that means. And I have this fear that if I come to you and I come back, let's say, in a week, and you're going to get upset and you're going to say, I said when I'm less busy, does it look like we're less busy? And maybe I thought it was, but you didn't. So now I'm in this place where I've just, I feel like I've upset you because I, I'm bothering you again, so I'm, I won't bring it back up. So that's why I, I kind of like to set those guidelines because... It could be a couple weeks, a couple months, a couple years. It's, it's not about the, the time that you need me to return. It's about knowing when I should return. <clears throat> At a high level, I need structure and routine. I need clarity, and I need patience and understanding from my manager. But I'm willing to be your most productive employee. I'm willing to produce the most thorough work I can and I'm willing to be your most dedicated and passionate employee. So where are some of the things that you may come across? <coughs> so, as I said, routine and structure is important to me. If I work in incident response, no matter what's on my calendar, what I wake up to may be different than what I planned. There could be an incident that I'm responding to instead of going to my 2 p.m. meeting. This is something I've learned to adjust to, and part of the way I do this is I find something that I can keep the same in every day. For me, it's my breakfast. Every morning, I'll go to Chick-fil-A, I'll order the exact same thing, and then I'll go and I'll start work. So despite not knowing how my day may occur due to the sporadic nature of incident response and the un uh, unknowns associated with uh, the role of a SOC analyst, I do know that every morning I'll have the same breakfast and that same part of my routine. 
ever since I was young, I've struggled with getting bored really, really easily. It made the summer times difficult for my parents because I would get so bored. Um, in adulthood, I've kind of leveraged that because I, I like to learn. So when I get bored, I kind of find, those th find things that I wanted to learn at some point and wanted to do and fill my time. And <clears throat> in the workplace, the thing is, so most employees, they'd run out of stuff to do. Hey, boss, what do you want me to do? Oh, no, it's cool. We don't have anything right now. Just hang out until something comes up. And they'll go on Facebook or Twitter or whatever's popular right now, and they'll, they'll just chill out. My thing is, like, in my mind, like, when I think about work, those eight hours are time to, like, work on work. Like, I don't take a five-minute break to go look at Twitter or whatever. So <clears throat> this at first became kind of like an annoyance to a nuisance to my managers because it was like, well, she blazes through work fast. She, so she's done everything on the list, and now she's just sitting there asking me what to do repeatedly. And they eventually learned that instead they can leverage this. They can have a stack of things ready to go, because when I'm in those like mindsets where I'm bored, I will literally do anything. I became the requisition order writer for our office. I filled out my boss's uh, travel reimbursement requests because I just wanted something to do where I felt like I was producing work for the company. And so that's, that's kind of a thing to, if, if I really need something to do, I'll do everything. So take advantage of that time. If there's any projects you wanted to do, but you haven't really had the manpower, or the time to do yourself, like maybe set those off to the side. And when that employee comes to you, hey, what do I do? Be like, well, it's not high priority, but since there's nothing else, what about this? Uh, like I said, kind of similar to the subjectivity, objectivity thing. I do better with specifics, despite thinking that academia is corrupted and terrible and I hate that degrees are required for jobs a lot of the time. I kind of enjoyed school. I think a lot of it was the clear nature of homework. They didn't teach you anything with the homework, but I like that the directions were like, click here, uh, then click here. Like, I realized that didn't teach me anything, but just my nature. I love that kind of like clear guidance on what to do. Yeah. In the workplace, I enjoy a similar thing. I'm more likely to excel at a task if I'm given more clear direction than just having paper thrown in front of me. I try to learn how to enable myself. I've been working on that, learning how I can take what I've done in pre at previous times and adapt it to my situation rather than asking for step-by-steps. But sometimes I still do need that, go click this, 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 and this, and you'll be done. I also get obsessed with things. Uh, previously, one of my large obsessions was uh, Doctor Who. I had some other obsessions in the past. and. It consumes my brain, my time, my thoughts, my Google searches. Everything I do will center around that object. As I'm older, I've been able to wane myself off those intense obsessions. Uh, I kind of regret not having them anymore because it was kind of it was like a thing I had, and so I've kind of lost that. But I still I still get hyper interested in things, and that's another thing that an employer can kind of leverage is the fact that. My obsession and interest in things means, like, if I get interested in something, I'm going to pursue it, I'm going to become an expert. So if you have an employee, you can encourage me. So, like, let's say our team is lacking someone who's interested in memory forensics. If you can get me interested, or somebody who's good at it, if you can get me interested in memory forensics, I will study it outside of work, I'll practice it, I'll do everything I can to learn those things and I'll become your expert. So that, that obsession, while it may seem annoying, I'm that person who talks to you about three, uh, for three hours about something you don't want to hear about. It can also be leveraged to become um, an advantage and uh, the, a quick way to have a skill set developed. The last thing that I tell managers is to like be a mentor. Communication is difficult sometimes for me and other individuals with autism. Um, what, what works well is having one-on-one -on -one time. 
because and talking with your employee um, it's it should be a bi-directional conversation you should ask them what they've been struggling with because sometimes I might not come to you directly just because I'm uncomfortable like bringing things up and I think it's my fault but if you say like what do what can I do to help you I'll be like well this thing I was struggling with could you like phrase that differently next time so let me tell you what I need help with so that we can improve that situation but also things like the talking loud I don't notice I'm doing that so I also appreciate when my manager tells me I did something because I may not have noticed it. And so if it's pointed out to me, I'm more likely to in the future adjust what I'm doing so that I'm doing it more appropriately. So a time of mentorship can be a time to have bi-directional communication and help improve, um, improve a working relationship. And the other thing about like telling me what's like what I'm doing wrong that I may not notice it's very important to me because right now I work with someone who's understanding and takes in like if I do something that's probably not super appropriate for an employee to do or that it would usually require disciplinary action my boss is much more understanding but the thing I like is he comes to me and he tells me what I did wrong he doesn't just kind of like and eh, that's just her shrug it off and leave because if he were to do that, and then I move on to a new manager who is not as, under, un, uh, not as understanding, and I keep doing the same thing over and over again wrongly, I'm eventually going to be fired when I could have learned how to correct the actions I didn't know I was doing months ago. So I, I completed it kind of short today. My throat's killing me, so I kind of sped through it. I apologize, but uh, that's all I have, I think. And I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Questions? Questions? No? Okay. Thank you. I do. I, do. I, um, I was just thinking in, in what you described yeah. and, and your skill set <coughs> and the area that you work in, mm -hmm. have you seen in your experience um, folks that are in like penetration testing and in that realm of security that uh, they excel in, in those um, areas? Well, I will sell, say surveys show that a lot of, uh, so, so the U.S. doesn't do much research into like the statistics of the presence of autism in the U.S., but uh, the U.K. does, and the U.K. does have a lot of statistics about hackers and those who have been arrested or fined for um, attacking computer systems, there's a high percentage of those individuals who have autism. Gotcha. So that, so kind of related, kind of, that mindset of attacking things gotcha. is, is prevalent. Yep. Anyone else? Yep. I have a student. Yeah. Part of my Cyber Patriot program. Yeah, yeah. Love Cyber Patriot. It's <laughs> an image of you almost. <laughs> yeah. And it's been a huge challenge for me because I love the kids. Yeah. How do I communicate and the one-on-one -on -one, I can mm -hmm. certainly that's been what has worked yeah one on a group not so good yeah one-on-one -on -one, but I would uh, yeah I always challenge I, 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 I always struggled with group group projects in school typically I just did all the work and then handed it to my group <laughs> and was like I don't even care just it's done because I didn't like working in groups that's kind of a skill that the individual is going to have to learn to develop over time. Um, a lot of encouragement and feedback that helps me. I know it's, it's, it's kind of that reward thing when I like do something in, like if I were to do something in a group that the thing that keeps me going and motivated and is I'm like a dog like give me a treat and you'll reinforce my behaviors. So kind of that encouragement that constant reinforcement like you shared in the group that is a great like awesome job. So that's something that at least helps me. And like I, I left out my disclaimer at the beginning that I usually do is like I was not voted like almighty speaker of the autistic people of the world. I'm speaking on my experience. Other people are gonna have different experiences. Um, also sec ops and autism, that's a subset of autism. I am not saying every autistic individual should be a security analyst. I'm saying there are autistic individuals who want to be a security analyst who are unable to at this point. So. It, it was a real challenge for me to teach. 
Yeah. All right. I, I wanted to. And I, mm -hmm. The other thing is, Cyber Patriot, you got five kids showing up to do a competition. Yeah. One of them is you. Yeah. <laughs> Those other four are not mature enough necessarily yeah. to be understanding. Yes. So I found it that that group dynamic of which I can't go in and referee legally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is a real challenge. Yeah. Um, and I'm experiencing it now. Yet, you know, I was like, I didn't sign up for this, you know. But I, it's wonderful to have you come and speak. Yeah, and yeah. Rest, okay? And uh, in that in that situation, I've mentored Cyber Patriots, so I kind of have the feel for how the competitions go. I think like trying to find him a role that's kind of isolated but within the team. So like you sit here, focus, you complete that task and bring us what you have as opposed to constantly communicate because that's not going to, he's going to struggle with that more. Whereas if you like sit there and say one, like, this is your task, run with it, and then come back and tell us what you found. Okay, that's what I've done. Yep. And that was about the only thing I can do. Yep. Like, you're my Linux guy. Yeah, exactly. Period. Yep. And then when you run out of ideas, well, then we'll let somebody else do it. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So, I just want to ask a couple questions regarding yeah. uh, the sources for the, the slide deck. Um, yeah. Do you have uh, the um, citations for uh, the, the study, A, the studies that you pulled, and, and B, um, the listing of companies? Because I'm finding that some of the, the couple of the, the, every company that I looked at that I can remember from your deck, yeah. they had since shut down. <laughs> oh wow! I should probably go update. I, I've been giving this talk for a year, and I haven't had. To, I'm actually revamping the content soon, probably in August. I'm gonna redo my entire slide deck. Um, I can give you my business card and send you the links to all my studies and the names of the companies. Uh, here we go. These are the companies that I have listed. I know Aspertise is still up, but um, yeah, specialists aren't had difficulties. Yeah. Empirical. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Who else? How do you write the job description? Um, <clears throat> that's a hard one. You. So the first thing is you have to be willing to go through more resumes. The issue is a lot of times companies are like, well, I'm going to say these specific instructions so I only get the best of the best. Whereas you need to be more open with your job posting so that you can attract those individuals who don't fit inside the square box. And yes, that means you're gonna get like a whole bunch of crap resumes that you don't wanna look through, but you're doing that so that you can find that one spectacular employee who didn't meet that exact uh, requ specific requirement. So being more focused on the um, the skill sets kind of and the mindset rather than the um, specific degree, super specific degree or X number of years experience. Um, so especially my main thing is like entry level. Like I think everyone's expectations for entry level right now, a lot of companies, they're way too high. You're looking for someone with a PhD to come fill your entry level SOC analyst job. And there are highly qualified people to do that job. And there are, there are people who want to be SOC analysts and want to break into security, but they don't have that seven year degree. And they don't know how to hunt for jobs because they type in entry level and they get someone wanting 10 years experience. So it's being a little broader and focusing more on the skills of the person as opposed to their credentials. That said, that my wish is that interviews would be technical hands-on interviews and say a question-based interviews. That's a culture change thing. That's something I cannot change personally. But if I were running my own company, I'd do technical hands-on interviews. Prove to me your skills, not your piece of paper that says you know the stuff. Anyone else? No questions or cool. comments. Very insightful. Thank you. Very insightful. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. I think I'm done then.